All right, folks, repeat after me. Tanstafo. 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 <clears throat> Tanstafo. Basically, it means there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Hi, I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and a business consultant. And I'm recording this in April 2020. And in the COVID-19 economy, it's important to say when you're recording these videos, because if you happen to be watching this a few years from now or a decade from now, let me remind you what's going on right now. The government is shutting down non-essential businesses. A lot of consumers are staying home uh, for the sake of social distancing or public health, and they're not buying things that they used to buy before. America is hanging by a threat, economically speaking, because we live in a consumerist society, right? Basically, our economy is measured in terms of consumption, what people buy. And when people have low confidence about the future, they tend to buy less or they tend to save money. Now, technically, they should have saved money many years ago. That way, they're not freaking out in today's economy. But that's a subject for a whole nother video. Long story short, businesses are hurting. Uh, people are losing their jobs by the millions. And we're looking to the federal government to bail us out, or at least to help us through these turbulent times. So generally, right now, you have people that are in the conservative, libertarian, Republican camp, where normally they would advocate against big government programs or against government bailouts or against handouts, actually somehow leaning a little bit left when it comes to this issue. And liberals and Democrats, for the most part, they always kind of want the federal government to uh, spend money in social programs and help everybody. I don't have any specific political affiliation. I'm more of a libertarian than anything else, which is why I'm making this video. And what I like to convey is that even though I've created a lot of content in the last couple of months about how to navigate these SBA loans, these Paycheck Protection Program loans, the employee retention credits, the stimulus package. So I created a lot of content around how to navigate that, how it works, and how to take advantage of it. I am in no way an advocate for big government programs. And unfortunately, in none of my videos, I took my time to sit down and explain that piece because at the, po at the moment, everything was moving so fast and I was just wanted to uh, help people stay updated and educate them on the things that I learned. So I want to take advantage in this video, kind of slow things down and talk about a life principle that I think it would help you, whether you're a small business owner or not. Generally speaking, it is important to be generally skeptic around uh, free offerings about stimulus programs, about, about getting money that you didn't earn through effort and free market. Now, I understand in today's economy, a lot of things are beyond our controls, right? What's happening is unprecedented because using the word unprecedented makes it very convenient for you to reason or justify out of your principles. It is actually most important in times of crisis, in, term, in times of unprecedented circumstances, to fall back to principles and to guide yourself with those principles. So unfortunately, our, our politicians, our leaders, completely toss the principles out the window and try to throw as much money at the problem uh, as possible to try to fix it or try, try to put a Band-Aid on it. And it's important to know that there's nothing free, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's actually not even the best possible decisions. There's only trade-offs. Now, let me show you a clip from Milton Friedman, who I think explains things a lot better. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a wonderful description of government that was made by a French economist by the name of Frederick Bastiat about 150 years ago. He said, government is that fiction whereby everybody believes that he can live at the expense of everybody else. And that is the free lunch myth. The myth that somehow or other, government can provide goods and services, can spend money at nobody's expense. Now, the particular form which that myth takes is very specific. It has two parts. One part is the belief that somehow or other you can tax business without consumers or workers or individuals paying for it. Somehow business is a big source, a big cornucopia out there that can be taxed at no cost. 
And the other way, form the myth takes is that you can create money at no cost. That if you turn the printing press, if you produce those greenbacks, that will enable people to become richer with nobody becoming poorer. Well, let me look at first problem. Can you tax business? What's business? There's no business to be taxed. There are people. Only people can pay taxes. Can I tax this floor? Can I tax the building? The building can't pay taxes. Only people can pay taxes. So when you talk about a tax on business, it has to be paid by somebody. Either it's paid by the stockholder, or it's paid by the customer, or it's paid by the worker. There's no other way it can come from. There's no, uh, there's no Santa Claus, no tooth fairy, <laughs> that's going to provide a source by which the government can spend money that doesn't come from somebody. Somebody has to pay. And yet, over and over again, you hear the claim, oh, we, cannot we must not increase taxes on individuals, we'll increase taxes on business. In connection with the current discussion of Social Security, this fiction arises. There is a fiction that the Social Security tax is half on the individual and half on the employer. Um, it's uh, that, that the individual only pays 5.75%, the employer pays, pays an equal amount. That's nonsense. That's bookkeeping. That's not economics. That's not reality. The part that the employer pays is part of his wage cost. If an employer considers whether it's worth his while to hire an additional worker, he has to consider as part of his cost not only what he pays to the worker, but also the extra taxes he will have to pay to the government. It makes no difference to the employer at all. If he pays the worker a bigger check and the worker pays a larger part of that directly to the government, or he pays the worker a smaller check, but in addition has to send a check to Washington. What matters to him is the total number of dollars it costs him to hire an additional person. So the fact is, the logic is, the reason is, that the tax on the so-called tax on the employer is paid by the employee. Now, this has always been clear. Hit pause and start hitting the comment section to tell me that I'm all wrong because of whatever. Let me explain this to you as an accountant, as a small business advisor, as a business owner. What Milton's saying, Milton, we're we going first, first name basis. What Milton is saying is, look, if you didn't have an employer tax, right, which today is somewhere around 8% in, in most states. If you didn't have an employer tax, it is possible that you would have, as a business owner, an extra 8% available to either give that employee a raise or offer them a more competitive rate. Or let's say, for example, we take 10 employees in total times the 8%. That would give me approximately enough money to hire an extra employee. Now, I understand that uh, we want the employers to, to carry a little bit of the burden of payroll. I actually don't see a big deal around that. I, I, I do see a certain sense of fairness where the employer is paying half of the payroll taxes that the employee has. That way, both have skin in the game, right? So the employer wants the employee to feel like they have money for their retirement in the case of Medicare and Social Security. And we want the employee to feel the hurt of that money uh, that way, when they do turn 60x, whatever it is, when they can apply to Social Security and Medicare, it feels like they've earned it over time. So, conceptually speaking, I, I'm actually not against, uh, you know, having the the business itself uh, pay a little bit of the tax. However, the, the 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 concept I'm trying to portray here is that this tax that the employee is not paying because the employer is paying is taking away from the opportunity to have access to more opportunity, right? So you have to understand that all government taxation is taken away from free market opportunities. Now, I know what you may be thinking. Well, without taxes, how will we pay for government programs? How will we pay for military? How will we pay for highways and schools and whatever? So I understand. I'm actually not against the government paying for things. I'm not against me paying a tax so that the government can pay for things. All I'm trying to convey here is that there's always a trade-off, right? We made the decision that whatever, 7%, 8%, whatever it costs 
on the employer side or on the employee side, we made a decision that it's better to sacrifice 7% from the employer, 7% from an employee, and have a safety net from, from when people retire. There's no good or bad answer, right? I mean, I could make arguments against Social Security and Medicare all day long, and I can make arguments for increasing that from 10, 7% to 10% or whatever. The reality is they're all trade-offs, right? We make decisions of trade-offs. So before you get ignited about the government doing something on the government not doing something, or the government has to spend money here, or I'm entitled to this much money there, before we get into those really uh, emotionally charged claims that we should depend on government for certain things, just remember that there is a concept of trade-off. Let's listen a little bit more. The distinction you have to draw is between who writes the check and who fundamentally bears the cost. It may well be that an official of a corporation writes the check for the tax on profits, so-called profits. He writes the check, but who pays it? He doesn't pay it. Here is a poor fellow who may be earning a, a, a modest competence. He may be writing a check for $10 million. That isn't coming out of his hide. Where's that $10 million coming from? It has to come from the proceeds of the goods and services which the enterprise sells. And that $10 million is $10 million less available either for cutting prices or for paying out dividends or for paying wages and salaries. The tax is borne by people. And for this reason, I must say, I have always myself been strongly in favor of eliminating altogether the tax on corporations. So it's open and above board that you are taxing people and that you do not conceal that fact by appearing to tax corporations. Again, I am not personally advocating that big businesses and the richer folks don't pay their fair share of taxes. I am actually not advocating for that at all. I'm actually using this as an example to think about trade-offs, right? If we decide to tax corporations more or increase the taxes on corporations, they will hire less people. They, they, have, they will have less money to hire people. Let's call it that. But we tax their profits. People always say, well, Hector, you only tax their profits. So profits are after you pay the employees. Well, think about it. If a corporation, and you've seen this firsthand, if a corporation wants to make more money to pay their uh, their shareholders, or they want to make more money to uh, make the risk of the of their shareholders or the people lending them money worth their while, they're going to have to cut costs somewhere. And where do big companies cut costs first? They lay people off. That's always been the case. If a corporation is in trouble, first thing they do is they lay people off, which sends me back to the Paycheck Protection Program and the stimulus packages that the government is coming out with during the COVID-19 uh, crisis because they know that when the economy shrinks, when the customer base goes away, when people don't have the confidence to spend, the businesses are going to go down, their sales are going to go down. And they're actually not taxing corporations more or less through these programs. As a matter of fact, in many ways, they're taxing corporations a little bit less in the short term, and on top of that, giving them additional money to keep their employees uh, on staff. So what the federal government is doing is they're mocking with the system, right? They're forcefully keeping employees on staff uh, for the most part for the humane reasons that people should be employed because I mentioned it many times that um, uh, unemployment is not just a, a financial problem, it's also a psychological problem. People need to work to have a purpose in life and all those things. So what the government intends to do, it's great, right? We, we we want to keep people employed. We want the small business to stay afloat. That's great. I'm always going to subscribe to that in spirit. But the problem is, as you've seen the execution of the gov these government programs, what ends up happening is the most educated, the, the better prepared, the companies that have the best lawyers, the best accountants are the ones that fully take advantage of all of these government programs. And the everyday mom and pop shop that was mostly affected by the economic crisis of COVID and they're still running you know, around like chickens with their heads cut off, they're not prepared to take advantage of all these government programs because it might be complex or because there might be some other circumstances like 
the banks getting in the way and setting up their own rules and all these crazy things are happening, what ends up happening is, is every time the government gets involved, usually the people that actually need the help, the, the people in which the politicians had the intent in mind when they made the decision or the trade-off to print more money to help the people are the ones that actually don't get helped. And now it, turn, now it turns into a much bigger problem, which is the problem of hyperinflation and the problem of printed money. Let's listen to the last part from Milton. Well, again, with respect to money, can you print money at no cost? It's very cheap to turn out those pieces of paper. But does that get society something for nothing? Not at all. It's simply a different form of taxation. If you print money, people have more money to spend. If they, spend, if they spend more money on the same amount of goods, prices go up. And in effect, everybody is paying a tax through inflation. Once again, it's only a form of taxation. We're talking about tax or taxation. Most people, when they think of tax, they think of their federal income tax return, right? They think of that additional piece that they pay at the government at the end of the year because they made too much money. Or they think about that additional uh, a price that they pay at the store when they add sales tax. But Milton uses the expression tax not just to talk about this, the specific money movement from, from a taxpayer to the government, also the devaluing or the, or the reduction of value of your dollar. You see, if the government was to have zero tax, let's just assume that for a second, we have zero tax, like in a communist government, right, where nobody really pays tax but at the same time, they all pay almost everything in tax. What ends up happening is the underlying value of the, of the currency of your country goes down. The, the purchase parity across, compared to other countries goes down. And your capacity to spend your money on the same goods and services in the future gets significantly reduced. So if you do the right thing of saving money, right, so you, you make a hundred and you you spend eighty and you save twenty. So over time, you can have enough money to buy a house. Where what happens is if we print money and we have uh, hyperinflation or we have a lot of inflation for that matter. By the time that you save the money to buy something you wanted to buy, that thing is going to be worth double and you will never be able to catch up. So you should never advocate for the value of your of your savings to go down over time. You should never advocate for the reduction of the purchase. Uh, power of your dollar, of whatever currency you have. So this is why we have to make the trade-off. And right now, unfortunately, we're making the trade-off of solving the short-term issue of allowing some businesses to survive. Because unfortunately, without an injection of capital, some small businesses are not going to survive the COVID-19 lockdowns, period. Now, you could argue that within those businesses that were trying to survive, there are some businesses that were bad in the first place, right? They have bad employees, bad policies, bad business owners, uh, borderline fraudsters. Yeah, that's a very small percentage, and you probably should weed them out anyway. But within that group, there's probably a lot of hardworking, honest Americans that, that just didn't have enough for this unprecedented circumstance, and they are going to have to depend on government uh, to stay afloat for a couple of months. And rightfully so, because for the most part, the government is the one that caused the lockdowns in the first place. So the government itself has a, a whole nother uh, situation when it comes to trade-off, which is, should we keep you know people alive by doing social distancing, flattening the curve or whatever, uh, versus should we open the economy and take the risk of some people dying. And then the underlying real question, which is how much is every life worth? Now, in my opinion, uh, the people that I love, my family, it's invaluable, right? I, I, I can't put a price tag to the life of anyone in my family, which is why I personally stay home. I personally social distance. Everybody in my family, even my mom, I haven't hugged my mom in a, in a month. And I know my mom's, it's safe, and I know I'm safe, and I know we've been quarantining, but I personally value my mom's life over time a lot more than the short-term satisfaction of, of giving it a hug. And I would never, in my wildest dreams, ever think that I wouldn't hug my mom for a whole month. But again, we make these trade-offs, right? We make economic trade-offs, we make emotional trade-offs, we make all sorts of trade-offs. 
So the point of this video is not to convince you or sway you towards libertarian economic way of life. It's just to think that there is no such thing as a free lunch. And every single time we take something for free, we're going to pay it in the back end in the form of a tax. Could be an, could be a, 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 an actual tax that you pay where there are tax rates go up, or it could be some other form of tax, like the reduction of value of our dollars. Now, let me give you another example, which I like to use very often in my consulting practice, which is the ignorance tax. And the ignorance tax is one of the most prevailing invisible taxes that people don't see. For example, most business owners are ignorant of the tax law, right? And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. They focus on what they do best, right? And they hire professionals who are the opposite of ignorant, right? They're experts in tax law and they hire professionals and they pay them a lot of money so they can help them do their taxes right or do tax planning. So the cost of that professional to do their taxes or do tax planning is called the ignorance tax. All the small business owners that two, three weeks after the Pitcher Protection Program or the SBA loan comes out, and two or three weeks later, when they just found out about these programs, are trying to apply, money run out. It's not available to them. They were ignorant of that information. Again, I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I just mean they didn't know, right? the lack of knowledge. That's called the ignorant tax, right? Every time you don't know something and you have to pay the price for not knowing it, or you have to pay the price of having to hire someone to interpret, in, interpret that for you or teach that to you or fix the problem you caused for breaking a law or something that you didn't know about, that's called the ignorance tax. So tax is it's, it's not just a physical uh, check that we write, write to the government. It's also every type of expenditure that you get for making the trade-off of making the decision of not paying attention to that piece of knowledge versus doing whatever else that you do. Now, I don't want to judge anyone that is ignorant towards the tax law. You know, my doctor, my dentist, they don't know anything about taxes, but they know about how to keep me alive, how to keep me safe, how to keep me healthy. So I'm not going to, I, I don't, I'm not being judgmental towards them. I actually want them to know nothing about, about uh, taxes and they probably would be okay with me not knowing anything about health as long as both of us are specializing in our own things and we're helping each other it's a win-win situation however when i have to consult two doctors three doctors and pay extra for that um that's my ignorance tax that i'm paying right or when the doctor you know has lack of confidence on their current accountant or their accountant doesn't know how to apply something for their specific circumstance and it costs them more money in tax. That's ignorance tax in both sides. So the, the, the lesson I want to convey here is let's not be ignorant, at least to the concept of trade-offs. So let's be very, very aware how trade-offs work. Now I'm going to play you one more clip, which, which also explains this concept of tans to file really, really well. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. This phrase is attributed to Milton Friedman. It means that there's always a cost to any decision. If an ice cream shop advertises free ice cream, is it really free? Tan Staffel. Consider the time it takes you to drive to the ice cream shop, wait in line, and so on. There are lots of other things you could be doing instead of getting your free ice cream. Tan Staffel can also explain why fun jobs pay lower wages than boring jobs. Imagine two jobs, both require equal amounts of skill, education, and so forth, but one of the jobs is a lot more fun than the other. And let's also suppose that the fun job has higher wages. So the situation looks a bit like this. So higher wages and more fun sounds like a free lunch, but tan staffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So what will happen? If two kinds of jobs require equal skills and education, then the workers will exit the industry with the low-wage, low-fund jobs and enter the industry with the high-wage, high-fund jobs. But as the supply of workers in the low-wage, low-fund job decreases, the wages in that industry will increase. And as the supply of workers in the high-wage, high-fund job increases, the wages in that industry will decrease. Workers will continue to move from one industry to the other until jobs that require equal skills, education, and so forth have equal compensation packages. Not equal wages, but a combination of wages and fun 
so that workers are equally happy in either job and no longer have an incentive to move. Notice that this means that the fun job has to have lower wages, or to put it differently, the job that isn't fun has to have higher wages to compensate for all the not fun stuff. So for jobs requiring equal skills and so forth, more fun means lower wages, and higher wages means less fun. It's a trade-off. Tan Staffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. The same idea applies to any other job characteristic and lots of other situations. So just remember, anytime you think you're getting something for free, think Tan Staffel. Also goes hand in hand with jobs that are high risk, right? So, um, so jobs that are high risk where you put your life on the line should technically be worth more money. Now, the ec economics hasn't really uh, done that really well because in theory, you would have uh, nurses uh, treating infectious diseases or police officers or firefighters making a lot more money. But for, ex for the a specific example of policemen and firemen, why do those jobs not have much, much higher pay uh, where they should because people are putting their life on the line. Well, probably because they're paid by government, right? So anytime the government pays something, it mocks the free market system. Anyway, the last note I want to tell you here is every time you get a free product, don't forget that you are the product, right? When it comes into Gmail, Facebook, all these products that are free, you're giving away your attention and your data and quite possibly your privacy. So there's always a trade-off. Nothing is free. Thank you. Hey! Here you go. Yeah. You didn't think I was really gonna give you a suit, did you? What, you're giving him the suit? That's right, and it's Armani. Armani? Hey, Armani, Jerry. Yes, yes, yeah. I heard. Come on, try it on. There you go. Yeah, okay. Oh, boy, look uh, at that. Yeah, that yeah, looks yeah. great, uh, huh? I can't believe you're giving him this. And I don't even want anything for it. He's very generous, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. I'll tell you what, you can take me out to dinner sometime. Hello. Hi, Jerry, it's Kenny. Oh, hi. I was thinking if you're not busy, maybe I can get my meal today. <laughs>